So, um, welcome everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, meet you in this final year's SAGD chapter session uh, this year, uh, Design and Research, Responsibility, Integrity and Respect, uh, Sensitive and Cognitive Experiences by Design. Before we start, let me remind that this session is going to be recorded, but it started already. If ever anyone is not comfortable of sharing screen, please turn your camera off. Uh, all questions and comments are encouraged, but will be shared in a group discussion after all the presentations have been given to ensure we'll keep to time. Participants are invited to put your questions and thoughts in the chat meantime, please. Uh, today's SAGD Riga chapter is supported by State Culture Capital Foundation of Latvia, Design Studio H HDVA, <laughs> Swedish Institute of Stockholm, and Embassy of Sweden in Latvia as project normcriticlatvia.com and images that change the world. To design a better world, designers need to practice benevolence, respect, and tolerance. To speak up and to undertake study for the civic society, to acknowledge and to recognize diversity, courage and integrity is demanded. It is about being a virtuous person and professional to sustain democracy and inclusive society. Let me welcome the first speaker, Associate Professor Nita Verma from Notre Dame University, Department of Arts, Art History and Design uh, from United States of America and her research, The Memory Project, Reviving Threads of Loss love and hope. Nita situates herself within discipline of visual communication design. Her areas of research and teaching explore the critical use of design as a tool for societal equity and justice. Her work focuses on systemic social issues examined through the lens of power and privilege and the examination of power structures within social ecologies. She teaches social design at the intersection of social innovation and collaborative practices and visualization of data that investigates the aesthetics, ethics, and politics of representation. Her current research project examine youth violence in urban contexts locally and the design of conductive environments for the visual, visually impaired in India. She, she holds an MFA from Yale University and currently holds faculty fellowship at the Center for Social Concerns, the Leo Institute of Asia and Asian Studies, Pult Institute for Global Development. Nita's professional design practice of over 25 years has focused exclusively on museums, cultural organizations, not-for-profits, and educational institutions. Selected clients include the American Red Cross, Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, Liberty Science Center, the New York, New York Botanic Garden, the New York Public Library, and Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Wildlife Conservation Society. Nita is also the recipient of several design awards, including Core 77, Graphics A Design Award, and International Design Awards. She currently serves on the SAGD Academic Task Force, and is a member of Pluriversal Working Group of the Future of Design Education. Nita, please, the floor is yours. Aija, thank you so much for the um, introduction. And with that, I will begin my... Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. Uh, my project uh, is called the Memory Project, and what I'm going to be talking about is design as a tool for social equity. In this case, it's addressing um, uh, youth violence in the city of South Bend. Uh, the project is supported by four grants from the Jesse Ball DuPont, the Community Foundation of St. Joe County, the city of South Bend, and the Center for Social Concerns at the University of Notre Dame. Um, the presentation examines the role of design in addressing a com complex social problem of youth violence in the city of South Bend using particip uh, participatory methods of engagement. Uh, 
Um, the problem of youth violence. So one of the things that has happened is that once uh, we completed our research, one of the things we 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 uh, that surfaces to the top is that the problem of youth violence does not reside in a singular cause, factor, or individual. Uh, it is a culmination of several aspects of social ecology that come together to create conditions that perpetrate these acts. Youth violence, therefore, is not a problem of individual choices, which is it is normally labeled as, but rather a multifaceted manifestation of the frayed social fabric. So a little bit, what I'd like to do is talk about the role of design and how uh, when designers engage with wicked problems, there's a paradigm shift in the way design and the role of the designer is being defined. One of the first shifts is from the individual context to the social context. The second one is from studios where you work within a, a, a very controlled environment, you move into living labs or communities. The third one is from creating art artifacts, you start creating social design interventions. And one of the reasons it's important to understand these shifts is because social contexts are far more complex than individual contexts. Living labs and communities are not soulless spaces, they are beds of invisible power. And the, as a designer, you need to understand how do you nav navigate some of those issues. And design and design interventions are not artifacts, but designed for the recal recalibration of the relationships within inherent power structures that exist within the um, areas that you work. I'm going to talk a little bit about my research that has uh, foregrounded the work that uh, Memory Project, um, you know, uh, kind of um, uh, embraces. Uh, these are some of the partners that I have worked with. Uh, and as you can see, you know, we can call them stakeholders, or I, I prefer to call them partners because we come together to kind of in a, in a, in a in a kind of united way of addressing issues. Um, this is basically the uh, research outline. Uh, the first part was the use of comparative methods of quasi quasi experimental methods to examine South Bend relative to similar cities. Uh, statistical data collection, uh, and I went from na national, local, uh, regional, and local. Uh, literature review that looked at positive youth development, and then uh, art as therapy uh, in the area of cognitive and behavioral psychology. Uh, field research and data collection included um, focus groups um, uh, to understand perceived causation. What do different groups within a community uh, believe are the perceived causation uh, factors. Uh, collection of external quality of life indicators, socioeconomic factors, law enforcement, geographical and environmental factors. Um, this led me to analysis and synthesis. And then I'm right now at the, uh, uh, at the uh, fifth stage, which is uh, creating design interventions. This project started in 2019 and uh, will continue all the way until 2023. And then we'll get into evaluation and uh, assessment. So this is one of the things, as you can see, I do not know if you can see my cursor, but the South Bend um, uh, rate is way uh, uh, higher than the national average or the comparative cities that have been used. As you can see, Chicago, Indianapolis, and Detroit have been used as larger cities. Lansing and Peoria have been used as smaller cities that match the demographics and the populations of the, of the uh, two cities. Uh, when we look at youth offenders and youth victims and the uh, impact of COVID, this was very essential to look at because I started my project in 2019 and we hit COVID. And you can see that, you know, except in Lansing, there has been a great drop uh, in the occurrence of violence. Uh, some of the things that we believe, especially in the, uh, as we correlate it with South Bend's medium income, uh, there was a growth of 11%. Uh, child poverty in uh, South Bend also decreased and child care vouchers in South Bend dropped. So maybe there's a economic correlation uh, between the, um, if you look here, what we are trying to understand is the instances of violence and their relationship to income levels. And as you can see, the greener areas have fewer instances 
all the uh, violence is located on the left-hand side uh, in darker areas, which are low, lower income areas. When we look at single parent homes, we again see a correlation that violence is greater in uh, homes where there are uh, single parents. Um, and that kind of starts to, uh, you know, kind of define a cycle of violence uh, that in, that encourages, uh, um, you know, uh, as opposed to something that encourages positive youth development. And as you can see, the disconnectedness from home and society, stability and structure um, lead to truancy, high risk behaviors, increased involvement with crime, steeper risk of brushes with the law, lack of resources, lack of structure, lack of role models and unpredictability. That's what starts that kind of and if you go on the right hand side, agency to, con uh, you know, it starts with resources and structures leading to connectedness and predictability, adult mentorship and support uh, uh, and participation in collective action that provides structure, positively driven tasks lead to skill and confidence building, uh, a development of understanding of consequences, self -reg regulation and uh, not uh, not engaging in high risk behavior. These are some of the ways in which these cycles kind of perpetrate some of the actions. What one kind of derives out of that is that is a thread, which is the lack of structure, lack of role models, disconnectedness, and uh, the role of family. When I started looking at the um, uh, uh, causation, uh, mapping causation. Uh, we worked with focus groups, uh, law enforcement, community members, community leaders. And these are some of the things that uh, emerge. And one of the things that comes to the top again is lack of structure, predictability, absence of role models. And as you can see, lack of structure and predictability take a, a front and central role in all this. So the three things that emerge in the in youth violence is uh, there are three insights that emerge. Family structures, especially mothers, are crucial to the mitigation of youth violence in the community, and mothers play a significant role in creating a strong social fabric within marginalized societies. The second one was the lack of structure, consistency, predictability, and regularity in daily routines emerge as one of the key factors leading to youth violence. And the third one is absence of positive reinforcers. Sorry. So because of those insights, one of the things that um, uh, when we started thinking about design interventions, one of the things I felt that mothers were a very, very important part of the whole equation. And that is what uh, brought me to the memory project. And what I'm going to present to you today is the uh, memory project. So here were my partners, the, my community partners, uh, the two on the left, Mamas Against Violence and Connect to Be the Change are grassroots level organizations that are led by women. Mamas Against Violence basically uh, embraces women who have lost a child to gun violence. And Connect to Be the Change, on the other hand, deals with youth that have had a brush with violence. Uh, so those two institutions, uh, organizations became the sources where I drew my participants from, and I invited the women from these two organizations. The Riverbend Quilt Guild was one that provided the expertise in making, in stitching, in crafting uh, the memory blankets. And the Center of so Homeless um, uh, is an organization that gave us the space uh, because it's very centrally located and it becomes easy for these women to come after their day's work to uh, congregate and it is centrally located and is close to some of the, if you remember the map, close to the center of the town where a lot of these communities are. And so it sits very uh, centrally in that community. This is what the process looked like. Uh, it was a 14 week workshop. And let me um, just begin by saying that the 14 week, week workshop does not go as planned because there are still women that are trying to finish their uh, blankets. And while the workshop has ended, the process still goes on. Um, the challenges and barriers that the participants 
uh, feel is for many, many reasons. One is, of course, the grief, but then also the fact that their lives are rocked by so many other variables and factors that one cannot expect that you start a, a session uh, or a workshop and expect it to end as predicted. Um, so the week one was uh, the process that we followed was week one initial ideas and formulations of the core group. I just want to talk a little bit about the formation, formation of the core group. Each mother was asked to bring people that would help her put together her blanket, which included aunts, grandmothers, um, uncles, um, uh, friends of the child that they had lost. Um, and that's how they created their core, core group. Um, then we started, I worked with two other uh, graduate students and what we started doing is working with these women to understand how did they want to present the, 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 the idea of the person that they had lost. Um, we then got into exploring material and methods of stitching. None of these women had ever touched a needle, let alone, you know, made, uh, you know, uh, anything. Um, week four and seven that you see as grief sessions are actually concepts borrowed from the Mamas Against Violence that runs a session every first Monday. And our, um, um, our uh, workshop was every Monday. And... Um, the grief session was basically women sharing their stories, sharing their um, their coping, the sharing their um, you know what they were kind of uh, how they were uh, dealing with their loss. Um, then we went into initial layouts and collection of artifacts, photographs, and memory memorabilia, uh, preparing surfaces, choosing matching materials. And then again, we um, uh, punctuated the whole session with a grief session. Um, we came then to fusion and stitching. You know, we found different ways. Uh, we created a toolkit by which we could see the way, different ways we could fuse um, material. Uh, that continued for three weeks and then came finishing. Um, we then uh, uh, documented the whole process and then we completed the pieces. Um, this looks like a very ideal, um, uh, you know, process, but it, it actually underwent many, many uh, uh, iterations, and they were different for every participant. Here's what the initial sketches look like. These are their little things that they have brought, the way they are trying to think about material, uh, what they want to put across. And as you can see on the right, her, her son was a uh, bas uh, a football player and so she brings her um, you know the jersey and so on um, here are some of the materials that were used here you can see the um, the toolkit that we prepared that shows different ways you can construct um, uh, you know the and here are some images of the actual uh, workshop uh, on on the top you'll see the graduate student working with one of the mothers who's laying out the her blanket on the right hand side, you see uh, the uh, the two ladies from the Quilters Guild helping them understand how to put something together. On the left hand side, you can see one of the helpers of uh, a participant uh, helping the um, uh, uh, with the stitching. Here again, you will see how um, you know things are being detailed out. Uh, how uh, you know material is being used and uh, stitching is being uh, you know carried out, uh, but some of the things that come out is the uh, healing the the process of healing uh, through uh, shared experiences connecting diverse communities. So the the women from the Quilters Guild come from a completely different region, completely different socioeconomic construct, and a very different cultural background. Um, a welcoming place for all uh, uh, to gather. Uh, this this became something that uh, the woman on in black over here, she would just come even if she participated or not, but she would look forward to her Mondays. And it created empathy, uh, uh, but it also made us aware of the privilege for those of us who were leading the whole. Um, here are some of the uh, blankets that have been created. Uh, in this case, it's a journey of the daughter and the mother is the one who has created this whole piece. Um, and um, she calls it uh, a lost life in pictures. 
Here's another example, a tree as a metaphor. This is a grandmother working uh, to create a blanket for her grandson who she lost. And she thinks of him as a, as a tree that continues to protect. Uh, uh, and, um, and I will end my presentation with a short video of one of the women talking about the experience. Um, my blanket tells the story of children that I lost, that I birthed, and the memory of me that I put inside the blanket of being broken how my heart was broken and now it's mended, like I mended it back together again. Because I've never been a sower and I took great pride in it and it just made me feel so good that I was actually putting life through something with my hands. Thank you so much for uh, for 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 listening to me. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Anita. It's, it's so deep and uh, so great story as a uh, design researcher and educator and a community maker. Thank you. It's really brilliant. Thank you. And uh, so I am present our next speaker and is a professor Jin Jo from Mammoth University, United States of America. And Jing will present her research from the Mother's Movement to Cradle, an interaction design for refugee children. Jing is an interdisciplinary and international recognized artist, designer, and researcher. She works at the intersection of visual communication design, interactive media, animation, video, and fine arts. Her work has been shown and collected internationally, including Trinale Design Museum, Milan, British Computer Society London, Asian Culture Center Manhattan, Sigfart Art Gallery, um, Arts Electronica, Arts Globally Gallery, of, um, uh, Royal Institution of Australia, um, New York Hall of Science, Danish Poster Museum, and many, many more. Um, Jing received the Creative Work Award of the 2020 Design Incubation, Incubation Communication Design Educators Award, the UX Design Award uh, of the 2021 Apparel Design Biennale, and many more of the USA, Europe, and Asia. Jing, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Freeman for this invitation and a nice meeting everybody here. So I'm going to start my presentation here. Um, so I would like to present two interconnected projects uh, and uh, an unexpected creative journey uh, from the Mother's, Mother's Movement to Cradler. Uh, interactive design for refugee children. Um, Cradler is a human-centered digital network concept designed to keep displaced children, a vulnerable population without cell phones, connected with their families, resources, and heritage. The seed of Cradler projects was so in 2018 when I launched the Jiang Jian project. Um, a, research, a research and web design initiative that sheds light upon the forgotten story of Jiang Jian and the mother's movement in China, which rescued and educated 30,000 refugee children during the Second Sino-Japanese War between 1937 to 1945. Inspired by the Mother's Movement and the European countries during World War II, such as the Women's Volunteering Service in the United Kingdom and their uh, large-scale evacuation of children in, um, uh, in the United Kingdom, Cradler is attempt to find a humanitarian solution for a complex, com complex social challenge that transcends political boundaries. It envisions a global network connecting various parties and uh, to preserve a collective memory, which helping displaced children to overcome many adver adversities and uh, receive more love and brighter futures. Now, looking back at those women who participated in the mother's movement in China and the women's volunteering service in the United Kingdom in World War II, they have um, 
devoted a good deeds to humanity, not only the study and honoring the, their contribution important to in, advance our common knowledge, but more importantly, to transform those lessons that we have learned from them into actions and new ideas is a necessary step. So Cradler is a project of the fruit of this humble attempt. Um, according to the United Nations, the global, um, the growing global refugee crisis um, in the recent decades has reached a staggering height. So over half of the population of the refugee population is under age of 18. During my research in 2020, in 2020 I discovered that no displaced cho um, um, children had the there was a plat there was no platform has been established for displaced children at that time. So this vulnerable population does not own cell phone, while 90%, 93% of refugees live in the mobile device area. So at that point, uh, uh, the Quidditch project began to sprout. So let's go back to the Jiang Jian project. I learned Jiang Jian when I was a um, ch um, child from my grandparents who knew Jiang Jian personally. I originally thought this just going to be a simple, quick um, summer project and do a quick website and put a content on the website that's, and, and, and that's it. But little did I know I would spend the next two years to uh, do the research necessary to bring her story to life. And this woman uh, passed at age uh, 38, and she was called the Chinese Nightingale, uh, Nightingale referring to the um, student nurse, mother of wounded warriors and a mother of wounded children. So she, um, doing her um, short, short three years of life, she has accomplished so much, um, and she passed away during the war. So after three years of exploration, um, I, I've also visited her family, um, in Hangzhou, and also went to the um, Zhejiang province where her uh, where her school was located, and also he she passed away. And then I also participated in the 80th anniversary celebration of Chinese wartime refugee children's relief and Edu education association. In Chinese, it's called Zhongguo Zhanzi Er Tong Bao Yu Hui. Um, and and then I realized the Chinese uh, the Jiang Jian store was scattered. Um, all over the internet, and there was no consistent story. Um, at that time, I just realized I have a challenge in front of me because as a designer, I was not a, really a content creator, but now I become, um, I decided to take the challenge to go on the research, find her story. Um, otherwise, I would, it would not be ethical to launch her website. So that took um, over a year to do the research. And then finally, I um, created the I finished the public uh, publication of her bio uh, for the Cradle project. I mean, for the on the Cradle magazine. See, that's also that's called those words are Cradle. So that's also inspiration for the, my next project, Cradler. It came out from uh, from from this official magazine. Um, so now, and then here is the website screenshot um, of the Jiang Jian website. One is Chinese. One is um, uh, uh, one is in, in English. Because uh, given a lot of time for this presentation, I will not go to the details of the of the design, but I would like to highlight a few points. I often get questions. People ask me why your design is so drastically different between the two languages. And uh, one of the reason is the audience. The Chinese audience they already know the historical and cultural background. I I do not have to give them from everything from scratch. So I post a lot of historical articles and evidence into this website. So this website is really content heavy, but the other one, the one in English, I need to introduce the culture, introduce the history and her life in a brief way. And the content is probably only one fifth of the of the Chinese website. So the Chinese website is so heavy, so I have to find a way to just, um, the focus is on, on the content while on the other one, um, the English one is on more on the aesthetic um, approach. Um, I used a slow motion and also HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, and uh, uh, open source framework to create the website. Um, and I also incorporated the Chinese window frames, little, little red um, 
triangles. Those are actually the Chinese traditional window frame to bring out the Chinese, the, the cultural background. Lastly, I devoted one page to this page to the mother's movement because Jiang Jian would not be able to accomplish what she has done without this movement. And um, and after the, I would like to mention after the war ended, World War II ended, uh, this movement has been in, in, inundated for for almost eight decades. And only in the last 10 years, there was started having books coming out talking about this. Um, uh, there, there was a book published and which helped, tremendous help in my re research as well to find out more information about the movement. Um, so, so at this point, I would also like to thank the digital art and the design community for recognizing the two projects. And I'm really grateful and humbled for that. There are two pivotal points for this project, how I transitioned from the Jiang Jian to Quidditch project. One is when I was researching Jiang Jian's project, I saw this registration book in, from her family um, record, the record in her family. So in this record, there was a children's name, age, um, gender, location, the parent's name. So you can see there's a very detailed a record for the for for those um, for those children and imagine there's thirty thousand of them thirty thousand so that's definitely there's a need there's a need for um for uh for this task it's a humongous task um so that at that point I thought okay if there's uh, something if we if they're in a digital age have those means that could help them a lot and then another thing I realized is when I was starting, so I started this project, but I was still not quite sure if this is a really approachable thing. Is that something really um, going to make a difference or something really new? Um, and then when I look at this um, map, well, after I finished this um, social pattern and the user journey, I started to see a pattern that there is a universal connection between the two different cultures. There was no communication between those women or those organizations, but doing the wars are all doing the same thing. The women are organizing, volunteering, saving the children. And, and um, UK have a very strong um, government and you have luckily have this systematic evacuation to save children, but in China, the government is really weak. And so they have a different structure, but the goal is the same. And then at this point, I would also want to touch the, um, the about a journey map. This map, I have to say, is a highly simplified journey map because a journey map is um, a visualization of processes that a person goes through in order to accomplish a goal. So there was no timeline, no emotion at this stage, but I would like to go into if there are opportunities for us. Um, so this map is highly simplified at this point. Ooh. All right, um, so now I would like to show a brief video of, the, uh, of this project, about three minutes. The phenomenon of displaced people has existed since the dawn of human civilizations. In these calamities, children have been the first victims of conflict and displacement experiences. The growing global refugee crisis in the recent decade has reached a staggering height. In nearly 80 million displaced people, 26 million are registered refugees, and over half of them are under the age of 18. One of the major disadvantages for refugee children is the lack of education opportunities. And yet, as of today, no digital platforms have been built for displaced children. The Cradler Project was created in hope of developing not only a digital tool, but a vision for a global network that might help displaced children to overcome many adversities and receive more love and brighter futures. This project is dedicated to these unfortunate children, the most vulnerable group who does not have cell phones. Through research and studying the lives of displaced children today and in World War II, before the establishment of international organizations such as the United Nations, certain social patterns and similarities started to unveil. These findings shed light upon the target users who are the guardians of displaced children. When user surveys and interviews cannot be carried out in the initial stage of the research, 
historical evidence and existing interviews of both current and past refugees provide direct insight into the users' needs and challenges. These discoveries laid the groundwork for the project. The final product embraces the connection and the communication among the displaced children, their families and temporary guardians, education affiliations, international and regional organizations, as well as volunteers and donors. The stories and personal data of displaced children accumulated by adults are stored and protected by the Quadrant Network Database. This database becomes a collective digital memory. The focus of this project goes beyond the realm of digital product design in an attempt to find a humanitarian solution for a complex social challenge. It offers a blueprint whose purpose is to serve as a possible testing ground, envisioning a digital network system that transcends political boundaries so that various parties can connect to rescue and nurture young lives collectively on a global scale. So um, I will skip a few slides. So some of those are my research um, process. And um, um, so this is a video actually I want to point it out is a Jewish children to, um, to London that was right before World War II breakout. So, um, so that's another aspect of the, this uh, research. And then the assumptions and the hypothesis and the concept map and the uh, user flow. Um, this was also really help, helpful to find out um, what are the steps need to be um, involved in order to build a, a network and a community for those children. And persona, I actually did four different persona and I want to be a be as uh, inclusive as possible from different um, background. So at that time in 2020, those were uh, people um, in um, in uh, hardship um, and the people are in exile, not exile, ref refugees and the identity and the illustration. So this is the final design and I would like to um, conclude the creative journey and design process presented in this talk were influenced by various aspects from both the past and the present. The renowned scholar Abraham Joshua Herschel pointed out that the authentic individual is neither an end nor a beginning, but a link between ages, both memory and expectation. On one hand, through the Jiang Jian project, I inquired, inherited, and examined the history, but on the other hand, Learning from my findings, I questioned, explored, and envisioned a solution for ongoing social challenge in the Quidler project. What stands in the first project is unwavering passion and compassion fused by the mother's movement. What emerges from the second project is a meaningful transformation of this, of this energy using digital means. As design and technology continues to evolve and reshape our culture, the two projects presented here were created using different digital media, yet linked by one single thread, the universal love and the reverence for life shared by many. Right. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Jing, so much. And um, amazing uh, stories to already come accomplished. And um, uh, please keep your questions and, and uh, add to the, our chat box and question uh, as well. So I'm glad to invite our next speaker, Anna Tobin, a multimedia designer and an assistant professor of graphic design of George Mason University. Um, and she will present her research on of her master uh, studies neurodivergent at the Maryland Institute of College of Arts in 2021. Anna's work uh, focuses primarily on experiential graphic design 
with accessibility at its core. She likes to mix and match traditional media with emerging media and incorporate experiences and play into her work. Prior to attending graduate school, Anna worked in-house for a nonprofit at a print and web design firm and at the environmental and exhibition design firm. She had been a visiting assistant professor at graphic uh, design uh, of graphic design at James Madison University. Anna has won over 30 design awards and has worked on projects for clients such as the World Bank, the National Park Service, Intel, and the Smithsonian. Anna, thank you. And the floor is yours now. Uh, Anna, uh, uh, have you started to talk as um, we can, can hear? Sorry about that. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Oops, uh, sorry, now I just messed up my screen. There we go. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. I started to talk without my volume on. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Anna. Um, so the project I want to talk to you about today is called Neurodivergent. Um, this was my thesis project at MICA, uh, and it's about learning disabilities and disorders. So I created a series of simulations about what it feels like to have four different learning disabilities and disorders and how to use their unique methods of learning. It's meant to promote empathy for and empowerment for those with learning disabilities and disorders. Um, so each simulation makes you do a difficult task, but it makes you do it in a new way, not the way you would automatically do it. And the reason for this is because people with learning disabilities often can't take the most straightforward path to learning. They have to take detours. Um, and in taking these detours, they often discover new ways of thinking and learning. Um, and this kind of pathway metaphor goes throughout the exhibition, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, so in doing this project, the questions I was asking myself um, where what does it feel like to have a learning disability? How can I use experiential graphic design to show neurotypical people what it feels like? And how can the learning methods used by those with learning disabilities be used by all? Um, so first I created a rendering to get my idea out of what um, this experience might look like. Um, and again, those like colored triangles on the floor, those that were meant to be pathways to each different learning disability. Um, so each learning disability is, and disorder is color coded to differentiate be between them. Um, and I also made this rendering because this was all happening when our school was shut down during COVID. Um, so I wasn't sure if I was going to actually be able to make the exhibition or not. So I was like, okay, let me get an idea of what it would be if I could make it. Um, luckily, they ended up getting me uh, access to like an external maker space and they allowed me to put up the exhibition, but nobody was really able to go to it because of COVID. So that's why I'm in all the pictures. <laughs> so. Um, so after, it's cut off a little bit. There you go. Um, so after I did that, I created a quarter scale model in Illustrator. Um, and then this is what the physical installation looked like. Um, so the way these experiences work is you begin at the iPad in the front. Um, this is an interactive where you learn about the project um, and begin each experience. So you learn about the project. Um, you can select one of the learning disabilities. Uh, then you learn about a story of struggle for someone who has that learning disability. Um, then you find out who this person is and that they're successful in their field. You find out the gift of having that learning disability. Um, and then it'll prompt you to follow one of the pathways. So you would follow the pathway on the floor to the learning method. I'm sorry, to the simulation of what it feels like. And then you would walk to the wall and um, experience a learning method commonly used by people with that learning disability. Um, so these are those pathways on the floor. Um, so the title in the center is made up of part dimensional lettering and part flat vinyl on the wall to further the concept that you must look at things differently in order to understand them if you have a learning disability. So here is um, kind of an image of what that first interactive would look like where you would select which learning disability you'd like to learn about. And I do wanna give the disclaimer that everyone experiences learning disabilities differently. Um, and these are just kind of based off of commonalities that I heard from talking to people who have these learning disabilities. Um, so I'll kind of walk you through one of the experiences. 
So you start at this iPad, you select the experience, um, and then let me play this. Um, so this is what you would see on the iPad. Uh, it tells you a little bit about the project first and some statistics about um, people with learning disabilities and disorders. And then on the next screen, um, so that's a little more. So the screen after this would let you select which learning disability you'd like to experience. So you would click on that um, and it would take you to this where it would give you a quote of somebody who struggled with this learning disability. Um, in this case, it was a um, woman who wanted to go to space, but she didn't think she could because of her learning disabilities. And then on the screen after that, you would find out who that person is and that they're actually a really successful space scientist now, and you would see all of their accolades. And then that would lead you to figuring out the gift of having this learning disability. And then it would prompt you to follow the pathway on the floor uh, to experience what it feels like to have that learning disability. Um, here's kind of just a quick image of the screen. Um, so you would follow that pathway to the floor. So this one's dyslexia. Um, and you would arrive at this um, these three acrylic panels that have backwards text on them and they're misaligned. Um, and they're on a sliding track and you have to align them in order to read the text. Um, and this is meant to make you pause and struggle to read like those with dyslexia do. And the text actually tells you what you just did after you do it. Uh, then you would follow that pathway to the wall and experience the learning method. Uh, for dyslexia, you would use image association, which when you encounter a scrambled word, you replace it with the correct icon on the right. Uh, and icons are on these little hanging tags. And this is because people with dyslexia often doodle in the margins of text to help them understand what they're reading. And then that would end the dyslexia experience. And if you wanted to do any of the other experiences, you would walk back to the iPad at the beginning and then kind of go through this same process. Um, they all start at the interactive screen where you hear the story, the gift, then they move to the simulation and then to the learning method. Um, so the next one is uh, reading disorders. Um, so for this one, uh, you hear a story of um, the story of struggle. In this case, it was an astronaut and he didn't think he could go to space. Um, Oh, sorry, this one's, sorry, <laughs> I, that's the wrong one. Uh, so this one's reading disorder. So this one, participants would learn about reading disorders. Here, a struggle of a successful journalist who, um, as a kid, couldn't read and actually couldn't speak. Um, and then he just, he uh, is now a successful journalist. He figured out how to learn. Um, and the gift is perseverance. So you would follow the pathway to the uh, learning, the simulation, sorry, stumbling on my words. Um, and this is kind of a, a couple images from the screens because I'm not gonna watch each one with you. Um, so the reading disorder simulation is a Mad Lib-esque activity where the center of words overlaps with similar words. You must use context clues within the text to figure out uh, what the word should actually be. So people with reading disorders often have difficulty finding the right word. For example, if a sentence reads, the water is really calm, they might read it as the water is really clam and then have to figure out what the actual word is supposed to be. Uh, the reading disorder learning method is a word association game. Um, there are similar words on the outside of a tab that you would flip up, and then you flip it up and it reveals what the actual word is. Um, and then each learning method, that paragraph of text there tells you what you just did. So the next one is ADHD. Uh, for ADHD, participants learn what ADHD is. They hear a story of struggle authored by someone who has ADHD. Um, and then the next screen reveals who that person is. Um, in this case, it was an astronaut um, and it tells how they are successful in their field. Um, and then the gift of ADHD is understanding. So participants would then, uh, here's a couple of screens about the astronaut. Um, and then participants would then follow the pathway to the simulation. So the ADHD simulation is a matching game with audio instructions. It's difficult to complete because um, other sounds play over the instructions to distract you from the task. And it's meant to simulate attention issues. Um, this is live at the link at the bottom, but I'm gonna play it real fast for you just so you can kind of see how this experience works. Oops. I will tell you where to place each colored square. Listen carefully and drag that square to where I tell you. First, select the blue square and match it to the cloud. 
Select the green square and another green square. Select the pink square and match it to a circle. So that's kind of how that one works. I hope the sound worked on that. Um, so then you would follow the pathway to the wall for the learning method. Um, the method for ADHD are mind maps. So essentially, uh, there's a bunch of bubbles and you have to organize them to be able to read what this says. Um, and a lot of people with ADHD told me that they create these mind maps with like way too much information. And then they have to like go back and organize it and pare it down. Um, and I was trying to emulate that. Uh, for dyspraxia, participants first learn what it is, hear a story of struggle authored by someone who has dyspraxia. Um, in this case, it's an actor. Um, and then in the next screen would reveal who that person is, how they're successful in their chosen field. Uh, participants would discover the gift, which is imagination, um, and then would be prompted to follow the orange pathway to the simulation and learning method. Um, and there's a couple slides for that. Um, so the dyspraxia simulation, so, uh, participants use their dominant hand to cover their opposite eye. Uh, they must then write their name in cursive using string wrapped around pegs with their non-dominant hand. Uh, this is meant to simulate fine motor coordination issues that those with dyspraxia often have. And the learning method for this one is tactility. So participants put their hand under the flap and they feel the words which are in raised lettering. Um, the sensation of feeling letters helps those with dyspraxia better understand how to form them. So many people with dyspraxia said that they'll write in shaving cream or trace letters on sandpaper to help them learn. Um, so it's meant to emulate that. And here's a close up of kind of what those looked like underneath. It was just hot glue to raise them. And because this was all during the pandemic, um, I did both like the design and fabrication. So I just put a couple of like screens of the process, like laser cutting, painting, color matching, printing, cutting, vinyl, applying vinyl, all kinds of things. Um, so all of these experiences uh, take accessibility into account. They follow both ADA guidelines and takes non-normative cognition into account, which is not really a part of ADA, but is accessible in its own way. Um, another thing I did in this project was use a font called Atkinson Hyperlegible. Um, it was created for low vision readers by the Braille Institute, um, and it's actually available for free on their website. I put that down at the bottom. Um, but it, this typeface, each character is distinct. So like no two characters, like a B and a D are not the same, just flipped around. Um, and I thought that that would be good for those with reading-based disorders because they often mix up similar letter forms like Bs, Ps, and Ds. Um, so what I was really trying to do here was take a multimodal approach because everyone learns in different ways. So I wanted to present the information in a variety of ways to make it more accessible to all. So that's why some parts are tactile, some are digital, some are more physical, and all are experiential. So in my survey, um, so I did a survey to over 40 people who have learning disabilities all over the world. Um, and I asked questions about like what it was like to have their learning disability. How would they describe it to other people? What learning methods do they use? Um, and that's kind of where the majority of my research came from. There were, um, I also talked to like neuropsychologists and like the learning, the disability services and schools and things like that did a lot of reading, but I wanted most of the research to come from people with these learning disabilities and my own experience as a neurodivergent person. Um, so in my survey to those with learning differences, the number one way neurodivergent people learn um, that they, they self-proclaimed way was kinesthetic learning, so learning by doing. So I wanted that to be a through line in the project. Um, and while exploring this project, I created a few supplemental projects surrounding that same topic. Um, they didn't make it into the final thesis, but I made a, I wrote a 200 page book about it and I expanded upon the definition of experiential graphic design to make it more cognitively accessible. Here's like a little sneak peek of like some of the pages in the book. And this also goes over like my research process and everything um, and walks you through the actual uh, experience. Um, I made a poster that just illustrated different learning disabilities. Uh, I also created a game based off the testing for learning disabilities um, and they're color and shape coded. And the way it works is one side has an activity um, and then you flip it over and you find out the answer and you find out what um, what that activity, which learning disabilities that activity tests for. Um, and the last thing I made was an app. Um, 
And this was just meant to, um, so it was to collect and share learning methods. Um, and I kind of gamified it. So it starts out with a little quiz that helps you determine what learning methods are best for you. Um, so this is like a little couple screens of like going through the quiz. Um, and then if you get to the end, you'll get your results. So this is like, oh, visual learning, kinesthetic learning, and auditory learning are some of the best methods for you. So then you would go to the next page and it would give you a couple options to try out different learning methods and they're gamified. So I'll just let it play for a second. So that's kind of like how it would work. And then uh, it tells you what you just did and how you can kind of use that in your own life. And then at the end, it gives you a, a way to share your own learning methods so they can be added to the app. Um, this is just a fun little Rezo gift that inspired uh, the motion graphic. Um, and that is it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Um, so we slowly stepped in the, the next idea, the next uh, subject that is inclusiveness and um, self reflection as well. And I'm happy to invite Linda, uh, who is a neurodivergent thinker herself, designer and maker. Currently, Linda is researching and making through experiential graphic design at the Technological University Dublin School of Arts and Design Creative Arts Master Platform in Visual Communication. Linda's background is in interior design and furniture design, but today Linda will present her research affordance of text for the reader with ADHD, case study of visual communication experiments as a process of her ongoing master thesis. And Linda will play a video uh, uh, of her studies. Linda, please. Thank you, Aya. Um, bear with me while I start the video. And uh, share sound, please. Uh, we can I started hear. my Master of Arts in Visual Communication in October 2021. It is part-time and runs over two years. At the beginning of my research, I had many questions. These questions mainly related to reading longer texts and what happens when I read. When I read, I get easily distracted by sound around me, by things moving outside the window, but also by my thoughts and ideas. It is quite extreme. I love reading, so this can be very frustrating. When I decided to start a master's and commit to two years of research, I looked at legibility and reading from various angles. At the same time, I embarked on another journey. In November 2021, I was diagnosed with ADHD. I self-diagnosed about six months before my official diagnosis. I had read an article by a woman who discovered she had ADHD as an adult. Her account of experiences resonated in many ways with me and what I had been struggling with over many years. I found myself in this deep rabbit hole of ADHD research and I read many articles, books, guidebooks, watched videos, and looked into my own past to see if the picture fit. The ADHD diagnosis influenced my masters in different ways. I found out that students with ADHD without reading difficulties are as motivated in social reading and engaging in reading activities as students without disabilities. So I ask, what happens when a human with ADHD reads? How can text be designed to make accommodations for the reader with ADHD? How can I use visual communication to show the interaction between attention and distraction during reading? How could a critical look at distraction and disruption of attention in humans with ADHD support and enhance acceptance and inclusions of humans with ADHD? I started taking Ritalin. My research path became clearer 
and I decided to let distraction in. I was interested in finding out what happens during a distraction while reading. I was reading an article that I found hard to stay with. I doodled at the side of the page. I discarded the sketch, but I felt drawn back to it. I started fleshing the little drawing out, since it was the fruit of one of my distractions. I worked on it, and I produced a final version as part of my research. It is a mirror frame whose shape arrives from the hand-lettered word neurodivergent. When something is divergent, it differs, differing from something else. In this case, a neurodivergent brain differs from a neurotypical brain. Typical in this case means brain without differences, such as ADHD. When I look at my reflection in the mirror frame, I'm forced to come in contact with the word neurodivergent framing my mirror image. Is the experience of viewing oneself in this mirror frame a reflection? The word neurodivergent makes it more than that, a diffraction. Maybe embracing the different kind of thought processes of a neurodivergent brain could be part of the solution to creating a more sustainable world. In spring of this year, I took part in an online workshop offered by Turku University of Applied Science in Finland. The aim of this workshop was to build awareness of sustainability in many different levels of professional work, identity, art and design-based thinking, and to create meaning of sustainability in our own work. The goal was to create a digital story on sustainability, approaching the theme from a personal perspective. This workshop gave me an opportunity to reflect on sustainability, environmental, cultural, economic and social, and share and discuss my ideas with other arts and culture students from participating universities. We all long to live in a fully sustainable world. To reap the benefits, we must embrace and include the way the human brain with ADHD works. I have ADHD. ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. It is a genetic long-term condition, sometimes also referred to as an invisible disability. It does not necessarily mean the person with ADHD has a deficit in their attention. Nobody suspected it when I was younger. I found it hard to concentrate in school. Teachers often reminded me to resume my work, stop daydreaming. My report card consistently said I should apply myself more. I should try harder, but in hindsight, that's like being asked not to have ADHD for a while. Girls with ADHD have been left undiagnosed or are diagnosed later in adulthood. This is often due to the fact that the symptoms of ADHD in girls differ to those in boys with ADHD. It is estimated that about 4% of the population has ADHD. People with ADHD are considered extremely creative. They have good problem-solving skills and are very innovative. They are entrepreneurial in their approach to work and they can hyper-focus on all of the above. In my work in visual communication, I'm looking to find a visual language promoting the amazing way humans with ADHD shine. To reap the benefits of a fully sustainable world, we must embrace and include the way the human brain with ADHD works. During the summer, I had the chance to work with a letter press under the supervision of the National Print Museum in Ireland. Through a workshop, I came up with my own letter press blocks. White space is essential when using and creating typeforms. Readability and legibility depend on them. Rather than assisting those, I wanted to let the space in between take over. 
I wanted to look more closely into the in-between. I want to put the background into the foreground to let it speak, to hear what it is saying. Is it dislocating the normal? Type is modular. Using the letterpress let me use wood type and create strings of letters that produced words we understand. We read them. We know the sounds, loud and in our heads. We know what the letter formations mean. We have given them meaning. What kind of meaning can we generate from the in-between? Through my research and thinking through making, I want to bring to the attention of people with neurotypical brains the distraction that happens for people with ADHD during reading. With this, I want to question the binary system of reading and attention and include distraction. For this, I want to give permission to distraction to come to the forefront and acknowledge it to be part of my neurodivergent style of reading. I want to manifest a space of permission for any human who shares this way of reading. Make the intangible tangible. At present, I find myself in the development stage of my master's. I finish in September 2023. Thank you to my lecturers Brenda Duggan and Claire Bell for their support and patience. Thank you to all the lecturers, technicians at Technological University Dublin and all my peers at the Masters of Creative Arts platform. Thank you also to Aya Freimane and the SEGD Riga chapter Design and Research for giving me the chance to talk about my work today. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, so much. Um, so we saw uh, study two different studies, uh, starting from empathy to empirical, and now we move to responsibility. And it is my honor to welcome our youngest speaker this today, um, and particularly uh, that she will talk about uh, young designers' responsibility uh, toward this subject. And welcome, Leah Clary. Uh, Leah is a recent visual communication graduate from Technological University Dublin School of Art and Design, Visual Communication. Leah says that throughout her college experience, her interest in design and creative thinking was hidden from the humble upbringing in the Midlands of Ireland. She has learned to appreciate design past and aesthetics, aesthetic level and realized its role as a functional communication tool in our everyday lives. Leah is the very beginning of her professional journey in the design world and believes that it is important to question and learn how we interpret and consume visual communication messages. Today, Leah will present tiny part of her undergraduate thesis research, Time to Change Perceptions a multimodal analysis of female domestic abuse campaigns in Ireland. Leah's research received an award, Best Thesis in Visual Communication in 2022. Welcome, Leah. Hi, hello. Hi. Couldn't share my screen. So um, thank you for having me here today. Um, and as I has mentioned, I'm a recent design graduate of the TU Dublin School of Creative Arts. So I'm delighted to present my research from my BA thesis um, called Time to Change Perceptions. Um, so this thesis is a multimodal analysis of female domestic abuse campaigns in Ireland. Um, so basically that means that I'm looking at elements within images and type in relation to case studies on the subject. And just before I begin, I would like to say that I am aware that this can be a very sensitive subject for some people. So if anybody does wish to step out of this um, segment, that's completely understandable. Um, so my inspiration and aims uh, for this thesis came in my second last year of my degree. So at this time, um, the COVID-19 pandemic was in full swing. And like many other countries, Ireland was in a really strict lockdown at the time. Um, but what we didn't realise was that there was another long-standing pandemic going on around us. And it did begin to sur surface in Irish news um, that there had been an influx 
of um, calls and um, appeal for help to organizations such as Women's Aid uh, for those suffering from domestic violence. And um, so when we all experienced the struggle of being locked up um, at home, I just couldn't comprehend how it must have been for those women locked at home with their abusers. Um, so I began to think, um, how is it as designers that we visually communicate this topic, um, specifically in Ireland, and what responsibilities do we have to communicate the subject as effectively as possible? Um, so my aims of the study were to create a framework that would help me analyse images and typographic components, which I could then apply to the campaign examples in the Irish context. And then this would lead me on to identify what the framework revealed about the portrayal of female domestic abuse in Ireland. And finally, from this, I could propose informed suggestions on how to portray the subject carefully and effectively through visual communication design. So in my initial research, I soon learned that just as we learn how to speak, read or write language, we break it down into the building blocks of grammar. And visual communication mirrors that process um, to create what is called visual literacy. So numerous visual communication design principles create what is referred to as visual and typographic grammar. And this is basically the ABCs of decoding visual material. And so just to give you some insight into those ABCs, and to break down um, this research. Visual grammar presents us with principles such as gaze, which is how participants in the image connect to the viewer through direct eye contact or how they disconnect through a lack of eye contact. Um, visual angle refers to the angle at which the viewer see an image, and this can have an impact on how we feel in relation to that scene. Um, position like reading in the Western culture follows a left to right where what is already known is often placed on the left, whilst the message appears further in on the center or to the right side of the canvas. Um, and viewer distance tells us a lot about our relationship with the participant and um, by how close we view them from. Um, color plays an important role in evoking emotion, but also to create focus through contrast and through highlight. And finally, vectors are directional lines um, created in images by elements such as light, which logically guide us through an image. So just like visual elements, typographic elements can also be broken down. Um, Anchorage refers to linguistic text that focuses accompanying images into a single message, whereas relay will add an extension or will add meaning onto that image. Um, micro, meso, macro typography um, consider choices in relation to the design of the type and how that communicates the message alone alongside the images as well. And all of these choices are what is semiotics or what creates meaning in an image on a piece of typography. So hierarchy then finally arranges this in relation to each other on the canvas area and it creates levels of importance and even considers where the eye might look to find specific kinds of typographic information. So from this uh, research um, that we've seen, I've basically taken a combination of expert theories and compiled them into principles or criteria for examining visual communication material. But now I ask, well, what do they contribute um, in relation to female domestic abuse campaigns? Um, and so this becomes the basis of my framework. So designed visual perception asks, what do the chosen principles portray in relation to the subject matter? and readability and uh, communication of typographic components, questions, how readable type elements are, and what is it that they do in relation to communicating the subject also. So just have a look at this framework in action. And um, this case study, for example, was a billboard campaign ran in 2009 with the aims of raising awareness amongst the community and their role in the continuation or cessation of such crimes and also to inform the community on how to take safe and appropriate action. So if we begin to break this campaign down, um, it's designed visual uh, perception. Uh, we're firstly met with this vacant scene, um, but if we use visual communication principles, they help us to almost play out the scene in our own minds. So the low angle from which the photograph is taken it, it's um, a method of intimidation to make us feel smaller than the scene and perhaps smaller than the subject reflected in the scene. And the use of dark color value adds to this dark emotion. 
Um, but it also creates a contrast, which creates salient, salient areas and they draw us into the image. So as mentioned earlier, um, position and vectors guide us through the image. So in this image here, we're drawn to the center by the light coming from the lamp, um, which guides us towards the bed. So being placed on the right hand side of the canvas, we can be sure that the overall message is related to the bed. So with the addition of the title, um, we can be assured that the bed is a substitute or what is called a metonym for the act of sexual violence. So the vector line leads down to the glass on the floor. Um, and this helps us imagine a scene of a woman struggling beneath her abuser and um, knocking the bedside lamp and the glass to the floor. When the light then draws across the room, it reflects onto the door and specifically the keys hanging from the door, um, which suggests that uh, the door was locked so that the abuse could go on uninterrupted. And um, so if we suspect abuse, even from a scene that we don't see any participants directly, maybe we should ask ourselves similar questions in the real world to help stop the issue. But it can be agreeable that the text accompaniment is doing significant work here um, because it anchors the message um, in the image uh, due to this absence of participants. So looking at the typographic design, and um, the bold way on the type is an analogy for the overbearing intimidation of such abuse. And it does aid in the readability of the message. And um, even to consider the space left between the two words wife and again reflects um, the, the continuation that's often experienced in domestic violence. The line beneath um, this in the subtext, uh, your silence feeds the violence is portrayed in a light typeface which reflects the quiet whisper to the audience, making them think about their actions. And the call to action and title are squeezed into what's called the real position. And this is usually where we expect to find uh, details, but as a result, we can see that the call to action has suffered and is now considerably small. And in a campaign where we're supposed to aid people on where to go to find help, it does help in counteracting that aim. So, when the image and um, the text communicate the subject elements, such as the absence of participant connection, a small call to action um, leaves us the viewers as onlookers who do not know how to go about helping. Um, and so really it's just about using design principles as carefully as possible to communicate campaigns um, and their aims as effectively as we can. So in this case study, um, this was a print and digital campaign, um, and this was run during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the aims of this campaign were to raise awareness about this ever-present uh, coercive control pandemic and to provide support to victims. So we're introduced to this image here with an instant connection through direct eye contact, and um, this is called demand gaze. So we're also at eye level and at close distance to the participant. So that makes us feel like we're being commanded to help this person. So her um, stare is quite widened and glossy and alongside the dark color value and the hues, um, it does communicate this idea of fear and upset. So we do notice that there is somebody behind her and we can see the arm leading to the mask on her face. And so the perpetrator then remains anonymous and is only present in part, which is um, replacing the idea of abuse with visual trope. So like in the previous example, we saw that uh, contrast can create a uh, focus on lighter areas in the image. Um, and this helps us to be guided throughout the image. Uh, so from the eyes, we're led to the mask on the woman's face, which is also a hand. Um, and this is a uh, basically using metaphor for coercive control. Uh, we're then led to a light point on the shoulder, which brings us towards the text and um, to begin to read about the context. And um, the title, The Hidden Pandemic, helps to anchor the meaning of the message. And again, we see the bold domineering type, which is reflective of the subject. Um, but the next line is really what makes it explicit that this is about coercive control and domestic abuse. Um, but it does appear considerably small. So the difficulty with the readability here doesn't help to fortify the aim um, to explain that this is the hidden pandemic um, and what the hidden pandemic is. And because of that, then the call to action as well is also virtually invisible. 
So it doesn't appear to be aiming to show victims where they can go to get support. And this was one of the essential aims of the campaign. And so the same lack of hierarchy and use of space for the text results in this difficult communication. And so again, absence of perpetrator um, aids in this uh, uh, idea where we rid of responsibility and the difficult text readability illustrates design principles that should be used more carefully so that they don't counteract the aims of these campaigns. And therefore they do create this perception around female domestic abuse that it becomes a helpless issue. So overall, um, through further case studies that I did conduct in, in this thesis, I began to notice trends within image and text portrayals of the subject. Um, so the images um, appeared to be replaced, um, well, the subject of, of domestic abuse appeared to be replaced by visual trope and by leaving perpetrators absent. So that removes accountability for the violence. Um, and we're often made to look upon images as onlookers uh, which makes the situation feel like it can be brushed under the carpet. Um, the victims are, are often made to look quite passive and they're always left unhelped in the visual. And overall, this can contribute to a helpless perception of female domestic abuse. So then typographic components um, are crucial to anchor polysemic visuals um, and they reflect the image in their own type design. So bold type was often used to reflect this on titles. Um, which also helped the readability to communicate the message. Um, but calls to action in particular made for difficult readability and overall this does not communicate that we can help or that we can show where help is available. Um, and this is, isn't effective. And again, it adds to this helpless perception of female domestic abuse. So from my study, um, I was able to create essentially what was a field guide for visual communication designers. And in regards to image, it was important to create a connection and avoid framing viewers as onlookers, um, which is possible through things like demand gates at eye level so that we're connected to the victim as an equal um, and we feel like we can help them. And um, so by placing underlying, uh, the underlying message also on the right or to the center of the canvas area, we can be sure that viewers will engage with the subject. Um, and by using close personal uh, distance to the victims in the image um, and salience through colour contrast, we can draw the viewers in um, deeper into the image and further connect with that subject. So finally, by using vectors through light, we can guide the viewer logically through the image, which communicates the message in a more logical and careful way. Um, I also noticed that type plays a crucial role to anchor uh, images of female domestic abuse, um, and these often appeared as polysemic or open to interpretation. So because the type is so crucial, it's appropriate that it lies on the canvas in key positions, and uh, not only to quickly communicate to viewers, but also to be uh, sufficient, to have su sufficient space to be read. Um, and the type weight should be used appropriately to reflect the subject and also aid in the readability. Um, uh, elements such as colour, size and hierarchy should be contrasted enough to be clearly visible and highlight the importance of each element appropriately. And as a final note, call to action um, are particularly, particularly important and make, uh, to make that, that active change and should be given really careful consideration. So just as a conclusion and a closing talk to this presentation, um, you can't be what you can't see sums up this study quite well. Um, and from my study, I have discovered the power in visual communication and how it can have an impact on creating perceptions around important social issues such as this one. Um, however, if we as designers don't use our knowledge as carefully um, as we can and we don't question our design, uh, we will contribute to creating dismissive perceptions around important social issues. But if we are diligent, um, we can and we will create a time where we can change perceptions. Um, and just before I hand over, I want to say thank you all so much for having me here today. And thank you to Dr. Aya for supervising my study. Uh, thank you, Leah. Yeah, it was my great pleasure to be a Leah supervisor as well. And i um, happy to uh, welcome in Design Research World you. And um, the next uh, is uh, Janette Eglite. Um, our speaker um, and Jeanette's background 
while working in advertising and design industries for more than 18 years and meaning the local creative managing the local creative organization Latvian Art Directors Club, Janet uh, has fo found her passion and interest also in academic field. Uh, she holds master's degree in creative industries and culture management, and as a doctoral student working on her dissertation, development of the creative product and the context of senses, feeling and experiences. Today, uh, Janet will share her research on sensorial inclusion as part of a journey of her doctoral thesis. Janete, welcome. Hello, everyone. Hello, Aya. Thank you for having me here. And uh, I would like, I think uh, my presentation will be quite uh, theoretical because my thesis uh, is more uh, more related to to like entrepreneurship. But uh, this, uh, this topic about sensorial inclusion was also uh, very interesting to me and uh, and I would like to, so uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yes, the, uh, first of all, that sensory features of products and services affect emotions, memories, perception, perception choices, and consumption. Uh, and the creation, uh, the creation of new emotions and or emphasizing uh, a new ones can increase the appeal of the product or service. And uh, this is important that all the products, services, and uh, also locations or uh, environments inspire, include, and reflect values of users, and therefore it uh, it's important that sensory features can foster inclusion. And the main question is that how can design take this aspect into notice and implement into the creative products and the environment? Uh, it might seem trivial that doctoral student is using Maslow hierarchy of needs, but uh, I would like to uh, I would like to emphasize that. There is not only physiological safety, love, esteem, and self-actualization things, but I think uh, uh, the very, very basic things are sensorial, which is our sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, vestibular, proprioception, and interoception. I will uh, explain these terms later. But if we think of all these basic needs, food, water, and everything as an existence, I think uh, there is even more roots like being, Actually, because without senses, we cannot experience no food, no air, no rest and no shelter. About senses, uh, in theory, there's usually there are usually five senses uh, covered, which is vision, hearing, smell, taste and touch. But also there is consider in uh, sensory in actually in the context of sensorial inclusion. Uh, this is vestibular or movement or kinetic sense, which is sense of balance and spatial orientation. Also proprioception, which is uh, related to body's muscle and joint movements, and also interoception, which are signals of our internal organs, which means when we are hungry, when we feel pain, these are also senses. And uh, these uh, senses are in, in core of how we actually collect the information, how we understand the world, how we develop meanings and how these mental simulations are used to generate our cognitive activity, such as attitude, behavior, and memory. And senses are all the means of communication. They operate in both physiological and the cultural level. And the complex sets of sensory abilities varies between the individuals and strongly influences aspects of our lives, including emotional well-being, perception, cognition, and behavior. And uh, there are several uh, uh, research is that uh, prove that people who lose the ability to use one sense can can gain a hyper ability in another in another sense. Uh, and if we think about products, uh, services, experiences, and environments, we should consider multisensory experiences because there is no only one sense included, but we use several senses in uh, in uh, sim simultaneously. And this multisensory design, as it is it called, uh, it provides it can provide rich, immersive, and access accessible experiences. And uh, Charles Spence, which is one of the greatest uh, academics in uh, sensory marketing and uh, experience field, thinks that the world is multisensory at all. And uh, I found uh, while I was uh, preparing for this presentation, I found a great resource. So I can share this later on that 
how important the senses are because uh, they can give us sense of tranquility, communication, identity, discovery, also to feel light, also to feel connection to nature. Uh, we can feel sense of belonging. Everything in our world is connected to senses. And imagine if uh, some of the senses are disabled, that, uh, for example, uh, the World Health Organization divides them in uh, three groups, which is uh, first is impairment in a person's body structure and function or mental functioning. Second is activity limitation, which includes seeing, hearing, walking, or problem solving, and also participation restrictions, which uh, uh, which include uh, which involve working, engagement in activities, obtaining health care, health care. And uh, if we look a bit uh, deeper into sensory disabilities, we see that uh, there are uh, vision impairments, which include not only low vision that people cannot see something, but they can be also completely blind. Uh, second are hearing impairments. Uh, problems also can uh, uh, occur uh, when people are born and during their also their lives. Uh, third is aut autism spectrum disorder. And as one presentation previously was mentioning that one out of five people, uh, students in America are actually with autism spectrum, spectrum disorder. And imagine if it's uh, about 20% of our population might be with uh, these disorders. This is a great number of audience which has to be considered in every in every process. And also censoring processing disorder that uh, people can misinterpret the world because others can hear maybe colors, uh, vision can be altered, uh, smells, touch, and it can be felt differently. And imagine feeling or seeing the environment in such a way, if you have, uh, for example, vision or perception impairments, the first picture is the uh, office environment, how it could look like if it's full of colors, textures, and, and bold forms. And second are shiny surfaces in the bathroom. And uh, how could we feel if we sh if, if, uh, if people need to experience such, a, such an environment? And uh, while I was looking for the information, I found this change of paradigm that uh, instead of talking about disability, where individuals have to make themselves like towards a more normal existence, we think of neurodiversity, that we create products and services for people, which addresses the needs of widest possible audience and can be used for everyone, regardless of their age or abilities. And the concept of neurodiversity was developed uh, in the uh, in 1990s by, by Judy Singer, who, who thought that uh, simply names uh, that no human, no two human minds are exactly alike. It means that we all are neurodiverse, uh, neurodiverse every one of us. And uh, yes, as I mentioned before, these are various mental abilities and uh, specific sensitivities and preferences. Also, this neurodiversity movement seeks to positively reframe certain neurological conditions by con concentrating on, on their strengths. And uh, which is important to emphasize this environment, not capabilities, that uh, individuals' limitations uh, shouldn't be based on the environment, but just on himself. What can he do or he wants to do? And also, uh, also, it was mentioned before that neurodiverse individual can, can drive businesses and innovation because uh, many of them are out of the box think thinkers and they can be entrepreneurs. And, uh, and here are some examples of, uh, of uh, senses which should be taken into account when we develop some product services and environments. Of course, uh, what, what, well, when I was thinking, uh, of course, you cannot uh, develop uh, a thing which is uh, which will be uh, uh, suited for everyone. It's not like for all. It's impossible. But of course, we can go into that direction. For example, in visual aspect, we can think of uh, that people have a sensitivity to light levels, flickering sounds, uh, strong reflections, bright bold colors, uh, and uh, instead, natural light and uh, materials and shapes of objects should be considered and uh, think how does this visual, visual feeling influences mood feelings and relationship between space people and objects 
And uh, we should consider the access to natural light to minimize reflective surfaces uh, to softer color schemes. If we think about sound, some noises can cause difficulty and distress. For example, some people use noise cancelling headphones, but also uh, maybe some things even we don't notice, for example, echo in rooms or acoustic transmission in the space. And also sound can influence wayfinding for deaf people with uh, different sensory abilities. And we should consider minimizing sound reflections, improving sound absorption. Also about smell, it could be a problem because, uh, and uh, I also think that uh, some professionals are misinterpreting, misinterpreting, misinterpreting the sensory marketing things, for example, in big retail stores, when there are strong aromas, uh, these can be very unpleasant and they can repel people from these areas. But if we use some nice aromas, it can improve productivity and encourage certain actions, for example, cafes or uh, smell of fresh bread. Uh, therefore, uh, should we consider zoning or, and uh, which may be a small detail, but it will help a lot, would be odorless cleaning products and their freshness. Uh, about touch, uh, it, this influences feelings and temporary attitudes towards space and other people and uh, use of materials and variation in temperature might discourage people from touching such fittings and fixtures. Uh, for example, I'm uh, very often afraid even when I see those cold metal, metal uh, tubes which uh, should be used for touching. This is not very pleasant, therefore what should be considered are, all, are, are questions how the all furnishing fabrics, sources of visual stimulation are minimized and are they comfortable to touch or maybe they stimulate. And for example, in, the, in also in the previous presentation when there were letters with surfaces which also can help learning. And taste, uh, uh, when I was uh, reading this, I imagine a uh, taste of wooden fork in my mouth and it's terrible. And imagine how, it, how is it for people who have oversensitivity to these things. And uh, they can also be resistant to tasting new foods or choosing the products because of textures, or because of tastes or because of some influences of them. Uh, and therefore, in the end, I would like to say that recognizing our diversity and aspects of sensorial inclusion will allow us to be all together, as it was mentioned before, that uh, no two human minds are alike. We can together to be retreat and to socialize. And uh, yes, that's what it. So that was my theoretical review of uh, sensorial inclusion. And uh, thank you for attention. Um, thank you, Jeanette. Uh, you put a, a great emphasis on the theoretical background and summarizing all the presentations today and started already question, is it only positive? And is there also some kind of negative or might be some problems caused? And therefore I am um, happy to invite our last presenter today, Sarah Christopherson, uh, professor of design history at Konstbach University College of Arts, Crafts and Design from Sweden. Uh, Sarah is an author of the book Designed by IKEA, published by Bloomsbury in 2014, where Sarah investigated how the world dominating brand IKEA has controversially come to define a nation. In her late last book, Hella, I will tell uh, in English, in Musical Chairs, uh, published by Volante to 2022, Sarah discussed how identity, politics, and culture affects academic culture. The book and today's story, Musical Chairs, uh, Identity Poli Politics in Practice and the Danger of with Norm Criticism, is based on a nationally well-known case at Konstak in Sweden. Sarah, welcome, and thank you so much for being here and sharing your experience. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I share my screen now, yes? Yes, please. Do you see? No. Yes. Like this? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, I would, would like start, I would like uh, to say thank you to all. Uh, it's been really interesting to listen to all presentations. 
Um, but uh, while I was listening, uh, I was thinking a little bit that I'm, I, uh, I feel a little bit odd in this uh, um, context. And uh, I, uh, I, I told you this already because I'm, um, I'm not a designer. I don't work with uh, design projects. I teach at the uh, design school since decades, uh, but I'm a historian. And uh, as I uh, said, uh, a professor in design history. So, um, but um, you have to bear with me. <laughs> Even though uh, I don't have, uh, I have a different perspective. Um, meaning I'm not a practitioner at all. Okay, uh, like Aya said, uh, um, I'm going to present uh, my latest book. And it's called, uh, if you translate the Swedish title into English, it's uh, Musical Chairs. Uh, but uh, so... Hela Havet Stormar, which is the Swedish title. That's the Swedish name for this uh, play. Uh, the famous game play where a, share of, a set of shares is arranged with one fewer share than the number of players. But Hela uh, Havet Stormar, or slash musical chairs, was also, it, the title also referred to a well-known debate in Sweden called the White Sea Debate. And the White Sea Debate in Sweden was not a debate about the sea in Russia called the White Sea. The White Sea is also the name of an exhibition hall at the University Konstfak where I work. And the debate as such was about this name, White Sea. And of course, it can appear like a very trivial matter. Uh, but one can also see the episode as a small part in a larger pattern, namely how so-called identity politics, which is a complex term, and cancel culture affects universities. And this specific episode took place at Konsbach, but as mentioned, it reflects general tendencies and the issues that I highlight in this book are principal and relevant in a broader context. But first, a short background. Uh, like I mentioned, the White Sea uh, is, as we see here, it's uh, the name of a venue at Konstfak, which is located uh, just outside Stockholm. And the art school, it's an old factory, actually. Uh, but the name, the White Sea, was coined, actually, already in the 50s, when Konstfak uh, was located in Stockholm City, here. Uh, because at the top of the building, there were several small rooms or studios. And uh, to bring in more sunlight and make the space more bright, the walls were torn down and the room was painted white. And voila, uh, the room got its name. But the name was also, it was self-evident, uh, but it also served as a slightly teasing Republican wink to the largest room in the Royal Palace in Stockholm, uh, which is also called the White Sea. So in other words, this name, the White Sea at Konspark, arose spontaneously. Um, and when the school moved from here, Stockholm city, to another a newly built house, also in the 50s, uh, the name came along and it became the name of Konstfak's big exhibition space, which during the 60s and the 70s became a 
sort of a venue for poetry readings, debates, meetings, concerts. And it quickly developed into an arena for, let's say, progressive activities, including rock concerts, often with a kind of a left wing or radical touch, because Konstfak as an art school has this sort of progressive uh, profile. And by this time, in the mid 70s, another room at Konstfak began to be called the Black Sea. And both names, the White Sea and the Black Sea, came along when the school again changed address in the late 90s. Because then Konstfak moves to its current address here, just outside Stockholm. So, in other words, this name, the White Sea, is, is in other words, it's not tied to a specific place or an address, but rather to traditions. And during the decades, it has become a significant part of the school's history and, let's say, progressive legacy. So, um, at its current address, the White Sea continues to be the name of the exhibition space, while the White Sea becomes the name of the largest auditorium. Until 2016. That year, the separatist student group called Brown Island is formed. This is a very small group for Racified. And pretty soon, this group points out the name as racist. They experience it racist. They can't find any concrete connection to racism because there is none. No one at all. But it doesn't matter because they choose to interpret the name as racist, feel it as racist and suggest a change. So the vice chancellor at the school established a working group to investigate this matter, which is being discussed in committees and councils for years. And I participate in these discussions and argue against the proposal, because the question is, can a name be racist just because someone calls it racist or experience it as racist? This name has a completely different story, not a single racist trace. And I write that in an article, 1st of February 2021, in the largest daily newspaper in Sweden, which I also belong as a critic since a long time. And at this point, the question has been an official matter for over two years. And the simple message in this article is, as it says in Sweden here, the White Sea do not have a racist history, neither today nor in the past. So why do I write this article? I think the, in, the question is interesting because uh, the issue is related to a broader discussion about identity politics. As you already know, in many cases, for example, old statues have been thrown away and names changed because of a dark past. But in this case, one couldn't find, let's say, a statue of an old oppressor, but one could find a name, but without any connections to racism. It had to do. So I asked rhetorically, shall we replace all names? containing the word white. How do we do, for example, with the uh, Beatles' White Album? Or Cream song, The White Room? Change it. Uh, but I also ask myself, should it be like this? Konstfak is a public university, and activities must, of, must of course be able to be discussed in public. Uh, it's a typical opinion piece, I write. So for me, the article is self-evident. As a researcher and as an as a author and writer, I even think it's my duty to write. Not everyone thinks so. Uh, first, a response from Brown Island, who is 
they are no longer students at Konspark, the ones who proposed this change. But so far, so good, because if you publish an opinion piece, you want a reaction. And I got it. That's how debates work. But what happens next is not okay. Immediately after the publication, a small group of teachers at Konsfak, not students, but teachers, they organize a collection of names. In other words, a petition. Students are not involved, uh, but the teachers, this small group, they write a reply and protest against me for bringing up the question publicly. And they use the university's email in, and invite all teachers at Konsfak to send in their names to an administrator. So at Konsfak, there's a lot of talk about inclusion. And I'm also included in this invitation. In other words, I get an email asking to sign a protest against myself. And at Konsfak, it's about roughly 100 teachers, almost half of them, 44 of my colleagues, signed this petition, where I am accused of exercising power. So 44 people point at one and claim it's about oppression. And it's claimed that I hurt the former students with my article. In fact, the article in the article i questioned the authorities or the management's way of dealing with the question but they also send emails to hundreds of students uh, where i am accused of lack of ethics and morals and at the same time this is within a week uh, the debate as uh, some sort of culture war explode in Sweden. And it continues for several months. All the Swedish daily newspapers, radio, television, pods, but not least social media, because this is during the pandemic. Everyone is sitting with their computer. So in my book, which I publish one year later, I try to discuss this debate and this issue in a larger context. How come this happened at Konsfak? One can say that this book has three legs. First, what kind of ideological climate caused this kind of proposal to change name just because someone experienced it as racist? Why is the proposal discussed by the vice chancellor and her staff for over two years? And what is the base for this behavior? Second, the debate as such. And third, how the university handled this matter afterwards. I would say that identity politics is not used at Konsfak. Instead, intersectionality is used again and again. And as you already know if you really have to define it very short uh, it means that the society consists of invisible orders and uh, power and high hierarchies this is a poster done in konstrak and the world is seen and defined in structural terms like above below oppressor oppressed strong weak and so-called norm criticism is in turn, very short, a way to discover and discuss oppressing norms often. And I believe that's really, really important and meaningful. We need to discuss norms. That's good. In reality or in practice, there is often a focus on very specific norms like gender, uh, for example, uh, racism, while others are left out. And then norm criticism tend to be normative. So that there are hierarchies are nothing new. Intersectionality and norm criticism is really fruitful perspective. 
The danger is if it turns, like in this case, into dogmatism. For example, of course, white can mean oppression. But if you see oppression in the word white as such, then we need to exclude many words in our language. White Christmas, for example. Um, at Konsfak, uh, like in many other university, inclusion and diversity are words of honor. But one may ask, how inclusive is this really uh, in this case? Because an important component and explanation for what happened last year is actually intolerance. Of course, the teacher who made this petition have the right to object to my argument if it stops there. But it didn't, because with this action, of course, it's a sort of bullying. The group state that if you don't have the same perspective, you are excluded. So it's the method that is the problem. And the method is, of course, related to strategies in cancel culture. And it's, of course, impossible to have an intellectual discussion with petitions. So behind a radical facade and ideas, there is a demand for purity and docility. And in the third and last part of the book, uh, I write about uh, how the university deals with the question when the public debate is over, because an internal investigation takes place. And the question is, of course, was this bullying? All the teachers signed with their professional titles. And but the conclusion is that they acted as individual, private individuals, not teachers. So in this way, no one needs to be held responsible. And for me, the story um, is a bit too bizarre not to be told. And in the book, I involve myself in the story and describe the experience of being in this culture war. Uh, but the most important part is that the story as such tell us something about our time and might also be serve as a warning flag. Uh, yes, and I'm um, a bit early, but thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you, Sarah, so much. And um, thank you. Thank you for uh, being here and uh, sharing your experience. And before opening a uh, discussion session, let me uh, conclude um, well, how I started to speak up and to undertake study for the civic society, to acknowledge and to rec recognize diversity, courage and integrity is demanded. It is about being a virtuous person and professional to sustain democracy and inclusive society. On behalf of SEGD Riga chapter and me personally, I am so thankful to you to share your uh, research, your experience and knowledge, and to open up a discussion. Let me um, ask you the first question. And uh, meanwhile, I'll go for the chat and look more. So the, the first question to all of you is, what do you see as the biggest professional challenges in the near future to address tolerance and inclusiveness? Who would like to start? Nita, please. Uh, you are muted. I think if you have to think of inclusion and tolerance, one of the first things we have to consider is our responsibility at designers. And you know, this whole idea of are we beholden to the artifact or are we holden to causes? Um, you know, design is ubiquitous, which means it touches many, many uh, areas. But I think what is important is for design to 
explain its positionality. And just as taking off from Sarah's presentation, I think in a way what she's talking about is positionality to vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular, um, uh, you know, incident or a, a particular stand that is taken. The point is designers cannot sit on the fence anymore. If we have to think about tolerance, if we have to think about inclusion, we have to think about responsibility and we have to jump on one or the other side of the fence. Thank you. Thank you. So, so next, I'd like to Linda. Yeah, I think um, the words that come to mind for me are openness, uh, acknowledgement and acceptance. Um, and asking for that continuously, but not only of others, but of ourselves as well. Um, you know, so we can um, encourage people to be courageous um, and accept uh, at the same time of differences and yeah, all areas of design and communication. Thank you. Who else? Meanwhile, I saw uh, there are so many thanks. I would say even million thank you to you, all of you, in the chat uh, uh, from all this, the participants today. So thank you once again. Would you like to come in, Anna? Oh yeah, I was thinking like, so I think that another uh, challenge in the design world is just, the lack of awareness i think a lot of designers just like do their job and they will design whatever but they don't think about accessibility as like a priority um especially in like print design i think there it's like really lacking like i know web design has like their own uh set of rules i know exhibition design has their own set of rules but print design it's a lot harder to find those and it's a lot less enforced so i think like just being aware of that and making sure you make it a priority, like each individual designer makes it a priority um, in their own practice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jing, would you like to come in? Uh, um, the first thing I saw, actually, everybody have said so many things. So I would like to echo uh, one, one thing is communication. I think Linda mentioned that. And the listening, I think it's really the tolerance also means endurance in some way. Um, and I remember uh, just suddenly, I remember Max Aurelius once said, you have to endure the speech, the freedom of speech. It's not you embrace, you endure, because so many times you have to hear the opposite and to try to understand the opposite of what they're saying, and then perhaps come up with conclusions that is more um, embraceive than for, for all human beings. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, some uh, said that thanks for to every presenter for a very thoughtful, provoking series of topics, and that's true. Uh, Sarah, would you like to tell or suggest the future? Um, well, um, I think perhaps um, my book is more or less, or uh, my talk was a super short summary of the book, but. Uh, is the answer to the question actually because uh, tolerance and inclusiveness is also about um, to have different um, perspectives it's not about uh, group identity only it's um, it's also about and in just in my case i didn't i didn't um, formulate a perspective i just stated a, a fact and um but um oh it's not only about identities it's also about ideas thank you mm. Mm. leah would you like to say something yeah i guess um i'm really just at the very start of my design career and like i think what i've noticed is just how changeable like the world has become and I think that like to be so inclusive, we kind of have to accept changeability and embrace changeability. Um, so I think as well, like kind of echoing what Anna said, like it's about giving time to design. Um, and I think that's, you know, how we design effectively. And I think just sometimes in such a visual world, we can kind of get trapped into designing for profit. Um, but yeah, I do think it's it's going to be about accepting changeability and 
kind of really moderating and asking ourselves questions um, about how we can include as many people and different types of social situations as we can. Yeah, there is a comment as well. It's important to weave this into the pedagogy of design education to sensitize students right from the foundation of education. So that's kind of sensing as well. But I have some more questions from uh, our journalist in Latvia, Ilze um, uh, Duobele. And she asked um, in, in such way, and may I read it? In 1983, I was started the project, the Hiroshima Appeals poster that transcends words to broadly raise awareness of Hiroshima spirit both inside and outside of Japan. Currently, it is organized by Hiroshima International Cultural Foundation, Hiroshima Peace Creation Fund, and Japan Graphic Design Association. This 2022 edition, uh, No Nooks, No War, is the 26th poster in the series. Other of this year, poster Kashiva Sato, one of Japan's leading creators. How visual graphic design can impact different audiences during wartime. So the close by in Latvia war, most probably Ilda has, uh, was willing to ask um, uh, situations, the topical nearby. So how could or how can visual graphic design impact different audiences during wartime? Calling back Hiroshima itself. Yes, Nita. Uh, you know, I, I think we have to be careful about the role that graphic design can play because it's like a two edged sword. It can be information at one end, but it can also be propaganda. And we have seen it in history. And I think understanding, and that's why the idea of linking and ensuring responsibility, uh, you know, as a, as a critical consideration in how you, um, you know, how, how do you pack some of these ideas is so important. Because unless, unless, you know, and again, that goes back to the idea of pen sitting, you know, how do you take stances? And how do you, and then as a designer, what is your responsibility? Are you, uh, uh, are you, um, uh, you know, uh, giving information? Or are you, developing propaganda. Those are some of the things that you have to really, really be very thankful about because there are ramifications. You know, there are very strong ramifications for the things, the words that you put out there. I mean, Leah's work basically shows in a way all that, you know, the way we read, the way signification works in society, you know, globally or locally. Uh, there are there are heavy you know, uh, implications to the work that we do. Thank you. And the next question is uh, for you, Jing. Um, in Hamburger Kunsthalle in Contemporary Art Collection is, a, is an art piece. In absolutely empty room, we can hear how sexually used nine years old girl is singing children's song. It is absolutely shocking. What is the role of designers in the rehabilitation of children who have been victims of war and refugees? Well, really good question. Number one thing is, although I did not see the artwork, I could already imagine. Um, just try to have this answer uh, short. I had experience with those, remember talking about the refugee children. Now they're 80, 90, 90 years old. When I went to the anniversary when they had in 2018, they told me stories. For instance, um, they were young girls when they were re recruited. If they sometimes if they don't get into a right right organization, they could be bought. They could be uh, human trafficking to become, a, you know, become somebody's wife. That's, that's, I mean, they, they can be bought as a property to become someone's wife. Um, so those kind of things happen quite often in, in those vulnerable populations. So my thoughts are two. Number one is they have to be, um, so designers need to be the someone to make the connections and connection with the people who guide them to protect them 
So it's not a connect children, it's connect those different areas. For instance, there are political, um, their government, there is an organization, um, uh, what's called the nonprofit organizations, there are women volunteering. How you use your design to connect them? So this, that's involve certain part of sociology and, uh, and and social work kind of kind of thing and also um to build a community like what uh, what uh, Nita was doing the building a community to bring everybody together that's one thing I think that's a really important role second thing is community a communicator because the children they are voiceless um they they don't really know how to uh, um, to express themselves. So one of the roles is you have to psychologically, um, to understand the psychological inside in some way. You have to, um, and and those things you you have to really ask the children, at, in the, I mean, have a real contact with those children. And then you come up with an idea to how, how to let them to, you, you basically communicate for them in many ways. And then you can help you to build um, community for the protectors and the guardians, the guardians to to have the community for them. I hope I answered the question. Right. Thank you, thank you. Uh, do we have uh, more questions from the audience and participants, please? Is there anyone? It's not in the chat. Uh, if you are willing to ask, please take a chance. If no, I am thankful you so much again from the SAGD Riga chapter and for from the all the audience and me personally to join and to help to create a, such a meaningful um, evening, I would say. Uh, here I am currently in Dublin, uh, evening in Latvia, evening in, uh, oh no, the, the morning part, uh, early morning part in America. Um, so thank you so much and uh, see you around the globe and thank you for joining us for this uh, discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Aya. And thank you, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Aya, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.